Chapter 1, The Search Why does a person study religion? There are many incidental reasons, but there is only one reason if a person is really in earnest. In a word, it is to come into contact with reality, to find a reality deeper than the everyday reality that so quickly changes, rots away, leaves nothing behind, and offers no lasting happiness in the human soul. Every religion that is sincere tries to open up contact with this reality. I would like to say a few words today about how Orthodox Christianity tries to do this, to open up spiritual reality to the religious seeker. The search for reality is a dangerous task, you all have probably heard stories of how young people in our times of searching have, quote, burned themselves out, unquote, trying to find reality and either die young or drag out a dreary existence at a fraction of their potential of mind and soul. I myself recall a friend from the days of my own searching 25 years ago when Aldous Huxley had just discovered the supposedly, quote, spiritual, unquote, value of LSD and had influenced many to follow him, this young man, a typical religious searcher who might be attending a course like this, once told me, quote, no matter what you might say of the dangers of drugs, you must admit that Anything is better than everyday American life, which is spiritually dead, unquote. I disagreed, since even then I was beginning to glimpse that spiritual life spreads in two directions. It can lead one higher than this everyday life of corruption, but it can also lead one lower and bring about a literal spiritual as well as physical death. He went his own way, and before he was 30 years old, he was a wreck of an old man, his mind ruined, and any search for reality abandoned. Similar examples could be found among people who seek various forms of psychic experiences, experiment in, quote, out-of-body, unquote, states, have encounters with UFOs, and the like. The experience of the Jonestown mass suicide in 1980 is enough to remind us of the dangers inherent in the religious search. Our orthodox literature over the past 2,000 years has quite a few instructive examples of this sort. Here I will cite just one. From the life of St. Nesitas of the Kiev Caves, who lived nearly a thousand years ago in Russia. Drawn by zeal, Nesitas asked his abbot to bless him to live in reclusion. The abbot, who was then St. Nikon, forbade him, saying, quote, My son, it is not good for you who are young to be idle. Better for you to live with the brethren. By serving them, you will not lose your reward. You know yourself how Isaac was deluded by demons in reclusion. He would have perished if the special grace of God through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Antony and Theodosius, had not saved him, unquote. Quote, Father, unquote, Nesitas replied, quote, I will never be deceived by anything of that kind, but I want to stand firmly against the wiles of the demons and to ask God to give me the gift of miracle working, like Isaac the recluse, who even till now performs many miracles, unquote, quote, you desire, your desire, unquote, said the abbot again, quote, is beyond your power. Be on your guard, lest, having been exalted, you fall. I, on the contrary, order you to serve the brethren, and you re will receive a crown from God for your obedience, unquote. Nesitas, drawn by the strongest seal for the life of, the, of reclusion, had not the least desire to attend what the abbot said to him. He carried out what he had set his mind on. He shut himself up in reclusion and continued praying without ever going out. After some time, once when he was praying, he heard a voice praying with him. 
and he smelled an extraordinary fragrance. Deceived by this, he said to himself, quote, If there were not an angel, he would not have prayed with me, and there would not have been the fragrance of the Holy Spirit, unquote. Nesitas began to pray earnestly, saying, quote, Lord, manifest thy, thyself to me intelligibly, that I may see thee, unquote. Then there was a voice which said to him, quote, I will not appear to thee, because thou art young, lest having been lifted up, thou fallest down, unquote. The recluse replied with tears, quote, Lord, I will never be deluded, because the abbot taught me not to attend to diabolic delusion, but I will do all that thou orderest me, unquote. Then, having obtained power over him, the soul-destroying snake said, quote, It is impossible for a man while still in the flesh to see me, but to look, I am sending my angel to stay with thee, carry out his will, unquote. With these words, a demon in the form of an angel appeared to, to the recluse. Nesitas fell at his feet and worshipped him as an angel. The demon said, quote, Henceforth, do not pray, but read books. In this way thou wilt enter into constant converse with God, and wilt receive the power to give solitary teaching to those who come to thee, and I will unceasingly pray to the Creator of all for thy salvation. Unquote. The recluse believed these words and was still further deceived. He stopped praying and occupied himself with reading. He saw the demon constantly praying and rejoiced, supposing that an angel was praying for him. Then he began to talk much from scripture to those who came to him and to prophecy like the Palestine recluse. His fame spread among worldly people and reached the grand prince's court. Actually, he did not prophesy, but he told those who came to him where stolen goods had been put or where something bad had happened in distant place. Obtaining his information from the demon who attended him, thus he told the Grand Prince Izyaslav about the murder of Prince Gleb of Novgorod and advised him to send his son to take over the princedom and rule in his steed. This was sufficient for worldly people to hail the recluse as a prophet. It is observable that worldly people and monks without spiritual discernment are nearly always attracted by humbugs, impostors, hypocrites, and those who are in demonic delusion, and they take them for saints and genuine servants of God. No one could compare with Nicetus for knowledge of the Old Testament, but he could not bear the New Testament, never took his talks from Gospels or the Apostolic Epistles, and would not allow any of his visitors to mention anything from the New Testament. From this strange bias in his teaching, the fathers of Kiev Caves Monastery realized that he was deceived by a demon, and at that time there were many holy monks endowed with spiritual gifts and graces in the monastery. They drove the devil from Nesitas by their prayers. Nesitas stopped seeing it. The fathers brought Nesitas out of reclusion and asked him to tell them something out of the Old Testament. But he affirmed with an oath that he never read, read those books, which he previously knew by heart. It turned out that he had even forgotten how to read. So great was the influence of the satanic delusion. And it was only with great difficulty that he learned to read again. Through the prayers of the Holy Fathers, he was brought to himself. He acknowledged and confessed his sin. He bewailed it with bitter tears, and he obtained a high degree of sanctity and the gift of miracle working by a humble life among the brethren. Subsequently, St. Nesitas was consecrated as Bishop of Novgorod. This story raises a question for us today. How can a religious seeker avoid the traps and deceptions which he encounters in his search? There is only one answer to this question. A person must be in the religious search not for the sake of religious experiences, which can deceive, but for the sake of truth. 
anyone who studies religion seriously comes up against this question. It is a question literally of life and death. Our Orthodox Christian faith, as contrasted with the Western confessions, is often called, quote, mystical, unquote. It is in contact with the spiritual reality that produces results, which are usually called, quote, supernatural, unquote which are beyond any kind of earthly logic or experience. One does not need to search in ancient literature to find examples, for the life of a miracle worker in our days is full of mystical elements. Archbishop John Maximovich, who died just 15 years ago and lived in this very part of California as Archbishop of San Francisco, was seen in glowing light levitated during prayer, was clairvoyant, worked miracles of healing. None of this, however, is remarkable in itself. It can easily be imitated by false miracle workers. How do we know that he was in contact with truth? Chapter 2. Revelation. If you look at a textbook of orthodox theology, you will find that the truth cannot be found by the unaided powers of man. You can read the scriptures or any holy book and not even understand what they say. There is an example of this in the book of Acts, in the story of the apostle Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment went, was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Acts 8.26-39 There are several supernatural, mystical elements in this account. The angel tells Philip where to go, Although to the Ethiopian, it seems like just a chance encounter on a desert road. And later on, after the baptism, the spirit of the Lord takes up Philip, who disappears before the eyes of the eunuch. But this is not what made the eunuch want to be baptized and become a Christian. There was something else that affected him, not the miracles, but something in his heart. Miracles, although they sometimes help a person to come to the faith, are not right reasons to accept Christianity. 
In the same book of Acts, we read the story of Simon the sorcerer, who wished to pay money to join the church and gain the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because they were very spectacular and miraculous. He was in the very lucrative, quote, profession, unquote, of sorcery, at a time when the more supernatural things one could do, the more money and prestige one would get, and when there were more of these things happening in Christianity than in the pagan world. As we know from the book of Acts, Sim Simmons' request was denied by the apostle Peter, and he came to a bad end, giving us the word, quote, simony, unquote, for the concept of trying to buy the grace of God. By contrast, when Philip spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, something in the eunuch's heart changed. It says in Acts that he came to, quote, believe, unquote. That is, his heart was melted by the truth he heard. The words of scripture are very powerful, and when the right interpretation is given to them, something in a human being, quote, opens up, unquote, if his heart is ready. Therefore, the eunuch accepted Christ with his whole soul. He was changed. He was a changed man. This was not for the sake of miracles, but for the sake of that which Christ came to, to earth to bring. The same thing can be seen in another place of the New Testament. When two of the disciples of Christ were walking on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24, Christ himself on the very day of his resurrection, joined them and began walking with them, asking them why they were so excited. They, in turn, began asking him if he was the only one who did not know what had happened in Jerusalem. They said that there was a great prophet who had been killed and then had allegedly risen from the dead, but they did not know what to believe. Christ then began to open their hearts and to explain what the Old Testament said was going to happen to the Messiah. All this time the disciples did not recognize him, for he did not come to them with signs and wonders to dazzle them. Later on, when they came to Emmaus, Christ made as though he would have gone further, and he would have departed from them unrecognized had they not asked him out of simple love for a stranger in need, to spend the night with them. Finally, when he sat down with them and, quote, broke the bread, unquote, as he had done at the Last Supper, their eyes were opened, they saw that it was Christ himself, and then he vanished right before their eyes. They began to question themselves and remembered that all the time he had been with them walking on the road, they had a burning in their hearts, even though they had not recognized him. What made them recognize Christ in the end was this, quote, burning heart, unquote. And not just the fact that he vanished out of their sight, because magicians can do that also. Therefore, it is not first of all miracles which reveal God to men, but something about God that is revealed to a heart that is ready for it. This is what is meant by a, quote, burning heart, unquote, by which the two disciples had contact with God who came in the flesh. Here we see how what is called, quote, revelation, unquote, comes about. The heart is moved and changed by the presence of God or by someone who is filled with his spirit or by just hearing the truth about him preached. That is also how the apostles had the power to go out to virtually the whole inhabited earth, to India, and perhaps even as far as China, to Russia in the north, where the Sith, Sith, Scythians were living, to Britain in the west, and Abyssinia in the south, in order to preach the gospel to all peoples within the first decades after the resurrection of Christ. It is the same today, even though people have become much more insensitive and dense spiritually, much less simple, and do not respond as easily to the truth. In the case of Archbishop John, those who have come to believe through him 
have been moved not first of all by his miracles, but by something that moved, moved their hearts about him. I'll give an example from his life, an incident that occurred in Shanghai, where he was bishop during World War II. It was related to us by a good friend of ours who, di who died a few years ago, a voice instructor named Anna, and she explained it. Archbishop John's fasting was so strict that his lower jaw lost power during fasting periods, and he spoke very indistinctly. She had the assignment of giving him lessons to exercise his jaw and make him speak a little more clearly. He would always come to her at regular intervals, and when he finished each lesson, it was his custom to leave a $20 bill. During the wartime, this woman was wounded and was dying in a French hospital in Shanghai. It was late at night. There was a fierce storm outside and no communication were possible in the city. But she had in her heart only one idea. Having been, been told by the doctors that she was going to die, her only hope was that Archbishop John would come, give her Holy Communion, and somehow save her. She begged people to get word to him, but they said it was out of the question. The phones weren't working because of the storm, and the hospital, since it was wartime, was locked up for the night. So all she could do was to cry out, quote, Help, Archbishop John, come, unquote. Of course, people said that the poor woman was raving, for there was no possible contact with him, but that night, as she was shouting these words, the doors opened up in the midst of the storm and in walked Archbishop John with Holy Communion. He came up to her, gave her confession, calmed her down. She was, of course, overjoyed, gave her Holy Communion and left. The woman slept 18 hours after this and waking up the next day, she felt that she had recovered. Quote, it must be the fact that Archbishop John came. Unquote, she said, quote, what Archbishop John, unquote, the nurse asked, saying that he couldn't have possibly entered the locked hospital on such a night. The person in the next bed to her said that someone had in fact been there, but still no one believed her. She began to wonder whether she had been having hallucinations. But as the nurses were making her bed that day, they discovered under her pillow a $20 bill. Quote, aha, unquote, she said. Quote, that's the proof he was here, unquote. How, one may ask, did Archbishop John know? How did he manage to get to her when there was no human communication possible to get the message across to him? One can say that it was revealed to him because so many things like that were revealed to him. But how was it revealed? Why to him and not to someone else? Why is the truth, it would seem, revealed to some and not to others? Is there a special organ receiving revelation from God? Yes. In certain sense, there is such an organ, though usually we, we close it and do not let it open. God's revelation is given to something called a loving heart. We know from the scriptures that God is love. Christianity is the religion of love. You may look at the failures, see people who call themselves Christians and are not, and say there is no love there. But Christianity is indeed the religion of love when it is successful and practiced in the right way. Our Lord Christ himself says that it is above all by their love that his true disciples are to be distinguished. John 13.35 If you ask anyone who knew Archbishop John what it was that drew people to him and still draws people who never knew him, the answer is always the same. He was overflowing with love. He sacrificed himself for his fellow men out of absolutely unselfish love for God and for them. This is why things were, were revealed to him which could not get through to other people and which he never could have known by natural means. He himself taught that for all the, quote, mysticism, unquote, of our Orthodox Church that is found in the lives of the saints and the writings of the Holy Fathers, 
The truly orthodox person always has both feet firmly on the ground, facing whatever situation is right in front of him. It is in accepting given situations, which requires a loving heart, that one encounters God. This loving heart is why anyone comes to a knowledge of the truth. Even though God sometimes has to break down and humble a heart to make it receptive, as in the case of the Apostle Paul, who at one time was breathing fire against and persecuting Christians, but to God, the past, present, and future of the human heart are all present. And he sees where he can break through and communicate. The opposite of a loving heart that receives revelation from God is cold and cold calculation, getting what you can get out of people. In religious life, this produces fakery and charlatanism of all deceptions and all descriptions. If you look at the religious world today, you see that a great deal of this is going on. So much fakery, posing, calculation, so much taking advantage of the winds of fashion, which bring first one religion or religious attitude into fashion, then another. To find the truth, you have to look deeper.